Okay, so uh, uh, welcome everyone. I'm very happy to host uh, Subhajit Roy today. Subhajit is a faculty at uh, Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur, India. He works on formal methods. Um, I think you name the kind of formal methods and he works on it, exact interpretation, proofs, model checking and everything. Um, so recently he used FSTAR to teach programming language semantics at an ACM summer school. And uh, he's going to tell us about that adventurous journey uh, in the talk. So Subhajit, over to you. Uh, thanks, Asim, for the kind introduction. Uh, I think it was more kind than it was supposed to be. Thank you so much. Um, okay, yeah, so uh, so let me just start unfolding the story. Uh, so as it happened that um, I was asked to give this lecture at this ACM summer school on programming languages. This is an ACM India summer school. And, uh, and as it so happened that we were supposed to pick topics, and uh, I'm always late about these things. So all the other topics got picked up and the thing that I was left with was semantics of programming languages. Now, uh, so we, we as instructors always try to pick courses uh, or topics for which we already have slides, right? So that's that's our only way of, only um, like, uh, like only decision point that we have. And I had never taught this course. So I did not have slides for this particular topic. But then I had recently watched Yes Man, and I was like, yeah, yeah to anything that is there. So I offered I offered to uh, take this course. True story. So let me just unfold the whole stuff. So um, so this ACM school, in just to give you a context, so this ACM school, summer, summer school on PL and compilers keep, almost keeps on happening every year, has been happening for the last, at least, I think, six to seven years. Um, so the whole goal is to motivate undergraduate students uh, towards higher studies. So generally something around 40 students are selected all across India. Uh, there's a selection process. Uh, it's a residential program. Students reside on the premises and they get a chance to interact with their fellow students and the faculty members who come to give the lectures. Uh, so it's about two weeks of lectures for faculty members, primarily drawn from the IITs. Um, again, like every year, like people are invited in specific topics and they uh, go ahead giving the lectures. Um, these are mostly graduate level topics, something that is generally not covered in an undergraduate course. And the whole idea is that looking at these topics, the students get really interested and they would like to go ahead with uh, these areas. So, um, so essentially, um, once this started, I had some sort of code structure in mind. How do I go about teaching this course? Um, so the, this was the structure sort of I had in mind. So the idea was that why even teach semantics of programming languages? And um, well, then go ahead and describe three very popular ways of describing program semantics, like operation semantics, denotational semantics, and exit semantic semantics. And then go ahead and traditionally the way we have been taught this course or the way we teach this course, I mean, we go ahead and after defining the semantics, we go ahead with uh, providing these pen and paper proofs of interesting properties that we can state about these languages, about the language that we are trying to describe. And then probably conclude the course and show a pathway for the future as to how what you can do ahead with this course. So that was the sort of syllabus or the sketch of the course that I had in mind when we started. So just to give a very brief background, I don't think this uh, audience needs much, but essentially we talk about the program semantics and the program syntax. The syntax in some sense talks about uh, the structure of the language and the semantics is essentially more to the meaning of the language. Now, if you look at even the, 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 the C language manual, the UC manual, you would see that these, the semantics is described in words. Um, I mean, for example, the wild statement, there is a there is a description of what the wild statement looks like in, in English natural language. And then um, there is an example of what it does. And there is a description of what happens when you have a break inside it or a continue and so on. And for some of the statements, like for example, if you look at uh, the for statement, I mean, it goes forever and ever. Like, I mean, like you start with giving you there's initialization step test and so on. And then the initialization assigns values and goes on saying you can write a loop like this. 
and then it starts saying, okay, but then things can go indefinitely. You can leave out the test expression. Then it goes and shows what can happen. Then again, it says that, okay, there is a comma operator as well. Now things look something different. I mean, again, gives an example. So as you can see, and it goes on and on. And, and as you can see, it sort of mixes examples and natural language to explain what these, uh, what these uh, constructs essentially mean. And uh, and we have been sort of, um, or I mean, we and the students as, as well have been reading these sort of manuals or textbooks to understand the, the semantics of languages. So the first question was to convince students that uh, per perhaps some more formalism is needed. Uh, and the problem is with uh, like, like having informal semantics is that for, for one, they are verbose. Um, they can possibly be ambiguous because you may, I mean, natural language is by nature ambiguous. Um, you may not be able, be, mean, you may have left parts of the semantics, difficult to cover everything that you would have want to say. And most, most importantly, it is not suitable for mathematical reasoning. So like going ahead, the idea was that we can tell students the ways of describing semantics more formally. And, um, and essentially we picked these three, three ways of describing semantics, operational semantics, saying like it sort of talk, talks about how do you execute a program, like uh, like how to execute it, like if you have a certain state and a certain uh, construct, then how does the state change after the, after the statement is executed or the expression is uh, executed. The next is what is the effect of the program? Uh, that is what denotational semantics tries to capture. It tries to show the program as some sort of a function. And then uh, exomatic semantics in some sense talks about what we can claim or assert about the program. So for this particular course, uh, the idea was to pick up this like somewhat extended while language, which is a very common language for teaching, um, teaching peer topics. Uh, so in this case, the language was had a set of uh, numbers, a set of variables, which could be uh, uh, names starting with letters, followed by letters and numbers. And of course, you can have arithmetic expressions, Boolean expressions in the language. And then we had the common programming constructs, like a skip statement, an assignment statement, a, sequential, uh, a, uh, a sequencing statement, uh, a branching statement, and a looping statement. And uh, and of course, for for arithmetic values, you could have numbers, and for Boolean values, you can have um, truth and false values. So, define after having defined the semantics, uh, the syntax. The idea was to now go ahead and try to describe the semantics more formally, and starting with the operational semantics, where with a with a construct and a certain state, you say that after executing the statement, how does the state change? Um, like for example, like if you have the if then else statement, it says that if the in a certain state, if the boolean which is the condition, uh, this b evaluates to true, and if s one in that state would have evaluated to uh, omega one, uh, and s two in the state omega would have evaluated to omega two. In that case, if b had evaluated true to true, then this whole statement would have evaluated to omega one. Right? That is the style that, in some sense, we're describing. In some sense, an interpreter, which is uh, which is saying how that how does the state unfold with each statement that is done. Um, and of course, you have this. That was a big step semantics, and you can have the small step semantics where you can detail uh, steps at a more finer granularity as exactly how the whole state is executing. I'm not getting into the details of it. And then again, you can talk about denotational semantics where uh, you express statements as functions, and you say, like for example, there's an assignment function, and this assign essentially says that you can uh, take a state, and so it takes an uh, a variable x and an expression e and says well i can run e in this um, uh, in this state and then update x to that value whatever it is so similarly you can we can write it for different statements and then the exomatic state the semantics where we talk about the correctness of programs so we have this uh, biggest liberal precondition operator which allows us to sort of say that given a certain condition if a certain post condition held then what must be the weakest precondition that must have uh, put before the statement is executed. 
Now, now these are pretty formal, and the idea was that to get this across to the students that this sort of formalism is really needed when you're really defining uh, programming languages uh, more formally. So now having the sketch in mind, and I was sort of happy that okay, I at least know how what to do. But then I sort of kept on uh, delaying <laughs> making the slides for it. And uh, then it was like almost like a couple of days before I realized that now I need to get, get something in because I had almost no material for this for the summer school. So the idea was like I rushed to prepare the lectures. And uh, to begin with, I started with the assignments that what the assignments I'm gonna give. And I started doing the pen and paper proof for the for the assignments. And they turned out to be hard, really, really hard. Like they were like really, really long proofs and uh, and uh, like, and the limited time I had, there was just no way I could have got these proofs through. So then the idea was that, so well, I mean, now a lot of the PL proofs that we all know are sort of uh, very long and tedious and error prone. But then there are a very few very creative points where you have to be very clever about it. But most of the places, it's relatively very mundane arguments. Like you have to go through all the statement types and show that, yeah, something really still holds. So now the plan was pretty simple. I was stuck with the awesome idea. The idea was to fool the students. And the idea was that, can I use a theorem prover to do all the proofs for the assignments? And then I'll act very smart and clever and go to the students and make them really toil hard at doing the proofs and like show them, well, you guys are not smart enough. Right. So, well, I have a shortcut to teaching this course. So then I started using, uh, uh, looking for a theorem prover and F star looked to be a very good uh, accomplice to this, this business. So, so I started uh, looking up the proofs that I wanted to do and started encoding these, these semantics uh, right into the, into the theorem prover. Like for example, now you be, I started off with the operation semantics and saying that, well, there is an, uh, evaluator for an arithmetic expression, that is what it looks like. And then for a Boolean expression, you have something uh, else and so on. Um, and, uh, and slowly I figured out that once you encode these semantics in, you can start playing with it. Like for example, this gives you some sort of a bounded model checker where you can like step by step, in some sense it gives you an interpreter and that allows you to sort of sort of like really unfold it into some sort of a bounded model checker where that you can use to start talking about interesting properties of the program, interesting properties of what holds and what does it hold. So um, I slowly realized that mo these modern theorem provers, I had some experience with uh, Koch and some other uh, provers, but um, I found that some of these modern provers are much easier to use. Um, like it's much easier to get started off on them. Um, and often they are, especially F star is like packed with these automated provers. So it is backed by Z3. So some of the proofs you can just brute force through them. Like even without coming up with clever invariants, you can just, just brute force through the proof and still get something running very quickly. Um, and like it helps you and doing the proofs for much, much, much more fun because you can focus more on the creative parts and uh, rather really toil through each type of statement and do the more mundane, mundane arguments. Um, and it allows us to really build more complex proofs than it would have been possible to do with pen and paper. So like it got really interesting and I said like, let's try to prove, for example, semantic equivalence. So took two simple programs and said like one of these programs is like uh, um, adding things in the forward direction, the other is going in the reverse direction. And let's say, can we prove that these two programs compute the same same value of k even at the end of this program? And um, so the, the trick was basically to encode the program in the in the in the language that so we had already encoded the syntax of the language. So in that language, we have to encode the program. So the two programs, program one and program two write down the, the theorem that we wanted to prove that of semantic equivalence and, and that's it. And F star goes about, like can completely prove this automatically, just like it uh, offloads this, the uh, whole unrolled program to Z3 and the whole proof uh, comes out like for small bounds, but this is almost no effort at all. So this was pretty cool. And uh, sort of like I got really excited about this whole business. 
and uh, then sort of good sense prevailed. And I said, why should instructors have all the fun? So why can't I sort of bring in the students to also experience this uh, really interesting way of uh, like playing with programs? So I mean, so why not expose students to this? So and so there were some pros and cons, and I had to sort of think a bit before uh, making this dive. Uh, so one is that um, so it allows the student to play with the encodings and build interesting tools. So that is something really I thought the students would enjoy a bit, and uh, like you can end up building like semantic equivalence checker, bounded model checkers, and so on. And I think it would sort of get across the 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 need for such formalism that is taught to them. On the, on the other hand, um, generally we are very cautious of not exposing students to hard topics really upfront. So like question was that can undergraduate students tackle uh, theorem provers? Uh, I mean, generally theorem provers are only exposed to graduate level classes, but like question was, can I really make this, uh, make this dive? And uh, like as instructors, I mean, we are always interested in doing sort of some sort of teaching experiment. And it says, looks look like perhaps I can make the students some guinea pigs and see if this experiment goes through. So, uh, so then I had to sort of change the sketch for the course and say that can I can I do it slightly differently? And these are the new things that came in. So they essentially after starting off with saying why we should teach PL which I, when I taught, I think did not really go off so well. I mean, the students were still not very convinced that why should they do it? And then describing the, the formal semantics uh, on the slides, the idea was now get into F star uh, after possibly relative, relatively boring classes of uh, through slides, hopefully get the students more excited when they're doing something. So the idea was to get students introduced to F star, do a few, teach them the syntax, uh, show them a simple, some simple proofs. Uh, in this particular course, I like tried to encode PNOS arithmetic and showed that, okay, well, you can prove commutativity, associativity addition and so on. And you can do some cool things and you can see that F star is able to really say that things are getting improved. Um, and then go ahead encoding these semantics and show them how you can encode them these semantics in F star. Uh, to begin with, we have to encode the syntax and then go ahead and show them how each of these different types of semantics can be encoded in F star. Uh, and then try to do some of the interesting proofs about the program properties. And finally, show that it is not just encoding and doing these, maybe the completeness soundness proofs, but you can go like you can um, further, you can take these things up and build some interesting tools like, I mean, they almost fall off once you have them encoded in F-star. So you can build like some sort of a BMC, BMC engine, maybe an equivalent checker or some sort of a deductive verifier. And you can see certain things happening. You can see real tools coming off with the, once these, these things are coded. So now this completely eliminates the need for any pen and paper proofs. And then of course we conclude and show them what you can do in the future. Uh, so for the assignments, the idea was to give them the F star implementations, rather mo most of the F star implementations, and leave some of the parts out. For example, when we're teaching operational semantics, um, we decided that we'll um, like put in the, let's say the assignment statement, but then leave out the branching statement and let them fill in the branching statement and show that things still work out. So now, um, like, so the two days sort of went through, um, it was sort of a mixed experience, but here is what sort of fell off the, uh, of the couple of days. Um, the initial reaction was interesting. I mean, yeah. the students were initially a little annoyed by the amount of formalism that was on the slides. Um, like there was just too much at the beginning and they were like, well, what's going on and why do we really need this? was what was going on. But I think it was pretty interesting when the F-star assignment started because the students, um, I'm sorry, this is this automatic thing. Um, so, uh, so it, but slowly the students, uh, when they started on the F-star assignments, um, the energy returned quickly and they were like, got a little more excited and I could see a lot more energy. Um, uh, 
slowly when they like started doing the proofs, um, there was an initial phase of shock and dismay. And so, Subhajit, can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah, Sim, please. So, uh, I mean, before that, what was the setup that you were using? Like students installed, were using STAR binaries or they were using uh, building from source or something else, Docker? And what was the setup? No, these were like the binaries. They, so they just installed the binaries. binaries. Yes, yes, okay. yes. Uh, I don't think at that time the Docker, this was like a few years back. I'm not sure the Docker was still available at that point. Okay. But I'm not sure, possibly. possibly. But but in, in my case, I just showed them how you can just download the binary and get it started. Thanks. And I sort of advised on the, um, the Emacs uh, bindings, but then I think the VS Code bindings are slightly better, but I was slightly more biased. So I sort of advised that you can use the Emacs bindings. So Subhajit, uh, I too have a question. Sure, Can, sure. Uh, yeah. So 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 when so when you were uh, using this, so weren't some of the students kind of uh, having this question? So uh, when F star is doing this brute forcing of uh, uh, thing for proving, mm -hmm. uh, weren't some of the students lost? Like uh, it would. Uh, so what was your experience where that they they wanted to? Some of the students might have wanted to see the internal steps of the proofs as well. Um, uh, that's a good question. So I think so, most of the students were very happy to see that proof was going through. Yeah, so the yeah, proof yeah. was sort of saying that, oh, well, QED and you're good. So uh, in most cases, the students were pretty happy to see that uh, the proof was going through. But when we were doing like more the detective verification proofs, then they were supplying the invariants and then they can they could sort of, in some sense, at least reason, yeah, look, looks like this invariant is good and so on. Uh, but that was for the later assignments when they were doing things with uh, with directive verifiers like uh, with whole logic with the axiomatic mm -hmm. semantics. Mm -hmm. But I think because I was doing the operational semantics to begin with, and at that point they were pretty excited to see that oh well these two programs it is just saying QED and it's happy. So yeah, yeah, makes sense, makes sense. Mm -hmm. Seeing the proofs go go through is a great fun. Anyway. It's a great fun. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The tool just says oh done. I mean they were yeah. very happy with that. Yeah. Thanks. Sure. So, um, yeah, so it was like, so this, like, PL is a very weird course because it sort of um, jolts you out of you out of your comfort zone because you start formalizing everything. And uh, it was the same, like, like, for example, even with numbers, just telling them, well, all these numbers are nothing but, but just nothing but a totally ordered set. There is nothing so sacrosanct about zero or one or two is sort of getting them like you you they you can see that they are like in a very weird state that what is going on um like when we were talking about like commutativity of addition that they had been taught in the second grade or so and and suddenly saying that you have to prove it i mean you cannot just take it for granted and it sort of sort of makes them feel very uncomfortable like why do you have to like prove something that you know is right i mean that was something yeah nick you have a question yeah, just wondering what, uh, you know, uh, these are undergraduates who have finished uh, how much of their undergrad studies? Ah, good, good question. So, sorry, I should have mentioned that. So, these are students, these were students mostly that finished their third year. So, this okay. is this happens in the summer break after their third year. And, uh, have, and they've taken some, uh, you know, some uh, discrete math and things like this before? Yes, yes. So generally, the, the CS uh, syllabus, the way it is structured in most universities is that the second year is like more the mathematics courses, the discrete maths and the initial data structures and these sort of courses, computer architecture. So not, not architecture, computer organization, like the basic uh, like setting of things. So this is what happened in the second year. The third year is where the most heavy CS courses happen. Like they would have seen an algorithms course, they would have seen a theory of computation course, they would have seen an architecture course, an operating systems course. So these courses have already happened. And some of them might have also seen a uh, principles of programming languages course. And, uh, and uh, are they coming from other IITs or uh, in general? Um, no, these are like across India, across universities. Okay. So they are mostly not from IITs. <laughs> I see. Um, yeah, so Thanks. yeah. Makes sense. Thanks. Uh, so, and, and the fourth year generally is more about advanced courses. So they would have, so by the third year, the students are sort of already pretty well versed with the, uh, the basic CS courses. I mean, what would you, you, you would need a CS undergraduate to know. 
So the fourth course, fourth year is more for the advanced courses, more electives where they are more interested in like getting to know a certain subject more in depth. And would you say so that this, their preparation is roughly, uh, you know, compared to your uh, third year IIT Kanpur students, are, are they in somewhat, they have the same kind of preparation roughly or? Um, that's slightly difficult to say because it is like university, universities of all across the country. So, okay. so it is like plus minus. It's like some universities are pretty good and I would say they are almost as comparable to students in the IITs, but there could be others, other schools which may not be that good. But then these are like 40 students selected all across the country based on something that ACM does. I'm not very sure how do they do the selection. So this was still a pretty, I would say, selected group of students, not really a very uniform sample or something. Thank you. So I would still suggest that these are like good students who were there. Yeah. Thanks, Ken. Thanks for the question. Um, right. And then like there was this, uh, there was this interesting confusion from a student uh, that the student came to me in the break or something. And um, like they were like, like when we're defining natural numbers, uh, the student could not see that where we are mapping the Z to a zero. I mean, they wanted to see where the zero is coming. I mean, there has to be a zero somewhere, right? I mean, you're building on top of the zero, but where is the connection to us natural numbers? And so these were some interesting questions. They might look very trivial to us, but from the student's perspective, like these are really deep questions that they are still thinking about. Um, but like once they started doing these assignments on F-star, uh, and they've started building these BMC engines and verifiers. I think I think uh, it was slightly more convincing that um, these sort of courses where you're formalizing like semantics of uh, things that sometimes you think you know are useful or or important. Um, and there were like in the breaks, uh, the coffee breaks and the lunch breaks, there were a lot of questions on a lot of very advanced things that I was not even planning to talk about. In fact, I did not even talk about in the regular lecture. Like people were asking like, how do theorem provers work and how do these proofs, proofs get discharged? So they were interested in things like curry how, how are isomorphisms, like how is type checking happens? Like what are these refinement types and so on? So they were sort of uh, getting interested about what is happening behind the scene. Um, however, not everything worked well, of course. Um, so I think we underestimated the learning curve of F-star. F-star is still a slightly steep uh, language to get started off. Um, so I had some hope that the students will pick it up quickly because one of the instructors had just covered Haskell in the previous sessions in, in the same, very same school. So I had assumed that having, having knowing one of the one function language, it would be easy to move to F-star. But I found that though the brighter students could quickly adapt and quickly pick up the syntax, um, like there were a majority of the students, though they were sort of enjoying the demonstrations when I was sort of doing things uh, up there during the lecture. But when once they were asked to do the assignments, they were sort of struggling to glue the proofs together. Like though the proofs were like, like some of the lemmas were left out and they had to fill in the lemmas and the main theorem, the proof of the main theorem was already in given the theorems where the lemmas were proved, but still they were struggling to get things in. Uh, however, the, the whole, like what at least I got out of uh, these a couple of days was the students could absorb the high level idea of the theorem proving quite quickly, uh, which is like sufficient to start on with the proofs. And um, the more detailed questions or the more tricky proofs should be like postponed to a more detailed course on theorem proofs. Uh, but there were a lot of students who were interested in the internals of theorem provers. And uh, somehow we like, we don't mostly ask. And even if the students have introduction to functional programming, still it looks like we need to provide enough introductory sessions on theorem proving. So probably we move just too fast from just assuming that it would very be, be very similar to like uh, functional programming, but it probably it has certain other ingredients that the students have to be sort of uh, maybe uh, pushed to push a little bit, bit more on. And finally, uh, theorem prover should be introduced just as a tool, right? Um, more detailed things about how they work and what they do should be postponed to maybe informal discussions, but not really 
brought down to the main sessions. And uh, I think the students have the most fun when they are really proving the theorem for themselves. So like creating good assignments wherein the students can um, have fun proving them is I think quite essential to, to this whole business. Right. So again, we have, we, I have like, we have published this small uh, paper um, appears in ICSI's, this, uh, the education track of ICSI called SEAT uh, and uh, this very year. Um, so this paper sort of gives a sort of a recipe that I can sort of we try to use about teaching peer, peer semantics using theorem provers. It starts with a very fleeting introduction to proving with F-star and then details how each of these uh, semantics can be encoded in F-star and then sort of closes with a summary of what we learned from the course. And the lectures are also available. So there is this NPTEL which uh, had recorded these lectures and they are available online in case uh, like there are students who are interested, they can go ahead and look at them. And I would also appreciate a lot of feedback on like what uh, you think went well or what did not went, go, go well and so which can sort of help the future uh, the future offerings of this course. So I think with that, I'll be like, I'll, I'll close off the meeting and I'll be very happy to discuss and like take any feedback or any suggestions that you have about this about business. Uh, thanks, Abhaji. We have plenty of time for questions. Um... <clears throat> Nick, I think, yeah. So I have I have a question uh, again. So uh, can you can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, yeah. So so uh, while preparing for the course, so, so very nice talk, uh, uh, and uh, <laughs> it looks very interesting. So I have been uh -huh. uh, my education has been in India, and I miss these kind of courses definitely. So this this is uh, good. So, uh, but but while preparing, did you did you look into uh, the other courses using theorem provers like Software Foundations, uh, which is uh, uh, using Coq to do this? Uh, were you able to yes. look into those kind of courses? Yes, I did look into some of those. But um, so one of the courses I really like is Dan Grossman had this course on PL semantics, and he had sort of uh, he was using OCaml to code these things up, and so Software Foundations is nice but i don't think it is taught in a more regular classroom so it is for people who are more interested they try out the assignments and all and uh, software foundations is not primarily on semantics um like i don't think it touches even denotational semantics so it's something like that so um uh, but i think i really like the Don, dan grossman's course because like he does a very good job of really um sort of uh, saying why we need semantics and all this formalism and then goes about encoding things in OCaml. And he builds this small interpreter using the operation semantics. And then actually they have quite a bit of fun after that uh, with that uh, with that setting. Um, so it was sort of inspired by that course that he had. And the idea was that instead of a programming language like OCaml, can we get it into a theorem prover? And perhaps that will sort of um, make it more fun so that that was the idea so and it was like primarily on semantics the whole course was just on semantics okay thank you thanks Ajish. and so uh, i have a question so how how flexible is this like the whole setup as in so for example is it conceivable that before the summer school there is one day of a boot camp where it's not about like teaching PL semantics with the star, but it's only about a star. Uh, no, so, okay, maybe I did not get it right. So if you can see on the left side, so these are the other lectures that happened. So this is a full PL summer school. Mm -hmm. uh, the focus is not so much on the depth, but more on the, or more on the breadth. Mm -hmm. And uh, the students were exposed to topics from analysis topics like data flow analysis, control flow analysis, to compiler optimizations, um, so we had this couple of sessions, few sessions on program semantics. Then um, um, I, I, I think there was something on current concurrency as well. So these are like a, 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 a huge set of topics that are taught. 
more at a at a at a breadth level than at a depth level just to expose them to these these topics not really like not really make them research friendly or anything like that but it was more like to expose them to these topics and show that there are interesting topics in pl and perhaps they would like to do their uh, postgraduate studies in this area so but these topics are preset and you have to pick i think you mentioned at the beginning that good topics are already picked and no no pl is a pl semantics is a good topic so <laughs> for an instructor the good topic was basically a topic for which the instructor has slides right so that is a good topic but there is a list of topics that's already set or you can right pick. right so generally somebody is coordinating this uh, this summer school and the coordinator generally comes up with a list of topics for for that particular offering so they Got say it. that for this offering we think that these could be a good set of topics that we would like to do Got it's it. not that things are set in stone or you have to like really follow that there is enough flexibility even for the like the lectures I and mean, they can decide whether they want to swap something off and put something in but mostly there is a sort of a yeah there is some sort of a uh, some sort of a setting that maybe this offering we would like to concentrate on these topics got it got it but i, have I mean uh, yeah yeah go ahead or yes. remark first of all i mean awesome talk uh -huh. and and and, and great uh, great effort in teaching this course i mean i i, I remarked in the chat earlier uh, perhaps it wasn't clear from my earlier uh, question about the students background I, I think it's really amazing that you're teaching this to students with a real diversity of backgrounds from a, a variety of universities and uh, that's really broadening access to these kinds of ideas so like thank you for doing that uh, uh, my question is is actually um, uh, you know, it, it, the material you presented, it, it could, I could imagine it can fill a whole, uh, a much longer uh, duration in a sense, like it, perhaps even a full graduate class can be developed around these ideas. I agree. I do agree. I do agree. Yes. Um, is, is there, you know, is there, um, uh, what, what is the, what is the PL class look, uh, the uh, PL graduate class or a PL focused undergrad class look like at IIT Kanpur? And is there room so, for such things in there? Um, um, great question, great question. So we do have a principles of programming languages course, um, and that teaches a lot of things other than semantics, like for example, the design of programming languages, to um, to type systems, to so it it delves into all the different topics. In fact, even starting with like what are the different um, like like uh, like you have these imperative languages, you have object oriented languages, logic languages, function languages, how they differ, why would you like to pick one over the other? Um, how do you mix construct? So it talks about a lot of things. And a lot of times I feel that program semantics is something which is sort of left out in the code. And uh, even when it is taught, it is more taught the regular way, which is like with more pen and paper proofs. Like you would write, write down the syntax and the semantics then try to prove things like soundness over them and things like that. Um, uh, so the, to be very frank, when I started off, because that is what I knew how this language, this course is taught. And that was the idea that I had that perhaps this is what I would be teaching. But then slowly, like uh, playing with uh, theorem provers, it became interesting that perhaps it can be sort of brought into this thing. Even, even at a graduate level, to be very frank, we do not have a course in program semantics, not even a course which have has enough focus on program semantics at, at, at this point in time. Um, we do have courses in functional programming and all. And to be very frank, there are a lot of students who are not even exposed to functional programming. So even a functional programming course is um, something that a lot of students want to take. Uh, but then at this point in time, this, to be very frank, the courses are getting less and less popular. So this is something I would have liked to even teach it as a graduate level course, or at least a modular course, which is a two month course, uh, which is another option we have here uh, in at the graduate level. Uh, thing to be very frank, one is that I need to prepare like long, large set of slides. That was one thing. The other thing is that, as you can see, the interest in these courses is dropping. So we are still struggling to get students into the more mainstream PL courses and a full like course on program semantics. Um, I'm not sure like how many how many takers we will get for such a course so but i think so much this kind of a summer school so i did not know about this acm india summer school and this setup uh, it may be very it, yeah as you said it's six seven years old so i had not heard of it before like you mentioned it to me i mean this looks like a great opportunity to 
present these yes. ideas and attract students right like if if, if this is after the third year uh, summer Haan. break Haan. then at that time they are picking up their btech projects and final projects right absolutely absolutely and absolutely. if we can like show them like look this stuff is cool then maybe we can attract students uh, uh, more students like so this sounds like a like good vehicle good kind of uh, I, I yeah I, I that, that was the idea of the summer school so they have been happening um on many other areas other than programming languages and but the pl and compiler summer school almost happens every year somehow some somebody or the other does pick up the responsibility of conducting it and uh, yeah we have been having it for quite some time now but then there are courses on like summer schools on algorithms there are summer schools on like graph algorithms there are summer schools so asm does this asm india is does this initiative of uh, doing this sort of money quite a regular basis and i do agree with asim yeah asim right i mean the, this i think is the right time for students to really uh, push them into things that they are interested in right and and rather tell them that there are interesting things to do so i think that is more important and that is sort of the objective of this course not so much like really to make them research friendly and really like uh, get them like star peer researchers or anything but it's just that saying that there are these interesting topics and you can maybe pick them up in the future right yeah i have a question um a little bit more low level um so proof automation is great until it stops working I know. um <laughs> so I, i'm wondering like are there certain areas in the course that presented like pain points when it comes to F star, um, you know, saying could not prove and, you know, helping students through that kind of stuff? Um, yeah, um, of course there were cases, but then like I was very careful to not really pick them because the whole point was not really not to get, make them struggle with F star, but to show them that there are these theorem provers available um, and sort of advertise them that probably it's easy to do it, which, may not have been so easy so i was like careful to pick uh, assignments which were relatively easy where they would not have got stuck into such problems um but of course yeah you're right so like if if they are like uh, and like the the students were given snippets of the proof so whatever were the more uh, tricky parts they were already filled in and they were supposed mm -hmm. to fill in the more relatively easy parts of the proof um so hopefully they don't get stuck that was the idea because it was very short so it was there wasn't much time to really like make them understand the intricacies of their improving and get them through. Uh, yeah, and, and actually, the students were pretty excited to just see it work. I think that is something was one reason that I picked F star because like you can just make it run even if like it's a bound of five, but you can see that it says well things are proven. It's it's pretty cool. So the students mm -hmm. were like pretty excited with the first set of assignments. Then when the theorem provers said oh good, so. I see. Thank you. I have a question. Uh, you briefly touched on uh, the aspect that students were like, you know, we know that arithmetic is commutative. Uh, so like, wh what's the point of doing this? Right, right. And right. I think the, the, if one, once you're like at the level of languages, programming languages, it's very difficult to motivate the, these kind of proofs. And did you have any takeaways like when teaching students, what was like, were they well motivated and if there are any generalizable lessons? there yeah that, that is that is very true in fact i mean um even peer semantics when you're showing these slides after slides of formalism it gets very dry and very boring um after some time and for everybody i think um so uh so it was getting a little boring and then we sort of immediately get got this session into f star and i think when you're starting working with this these proofs like the students sort of started getting excited and I think the the point where the students started appreciating that something interesting has happened was when they were able to build something which worked. Like when they when you say that see there are two different programs and proving that they come to the same thing is not easy, but then you can do it. Like once you have encoded the semantics, you can actually write a small verifier which can verify that they do the same thing. Um, I think that is something where they started realizing yeah you are doing something which is probably has some value. Um, right. But yeah, I think that was one of the motivations I could I could think about. But uh, 
yeah otherwise it is yeah, yeah you are completely right it is very difficult to sort of get this across that why would you need to do this to sign thank you sure Uh, so, Vidika, I'm, I'm interested in your remark about, you know, um, uh, about the population of students who are interested in these ideas kind of, uh, you know, I don't know, diminishing or uh, you know, hard to attract people to these topics. I wonder, you know, um, uh, programming language semantics is, uh, is I, I agree, quite abstract. And maybe sometimes people wonder why are we formalizing this kind of thing? They just take it for granted. Is there some... What 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 do you think would be the reaction to a course that sort of started with semantics and ended with with more like program verification, like being able to prove things about programs that you write, you know, and and it's less about formalizing. I mean, maybe you start from understanding what a small language means, but you end with I don't know building verified Rust programs or something. Right. Like, so uh, yeah, I, I will. I mean, I have a course that I teach on programming, uh, program analysis, verifications, techniques. And again, we don't really get into very practical systems, but it's again a very breadth course. So we talk about directive verification type systems. And so uh, what, in one of the offerings, I started with program semantics. Again, not of even a language like extended while, but it was a very simple typed uh, lambda calculus. And um, well, it was slightly extended type lambda calculus because like you had uh, even numbers and all settings so that you don't have to encode those things. And the number of uh, takers in that course reduced to four. So, so I think it was a pretty, uh, I don't know. I mean, the students, um, I don't know what is a good way, Nick. I don't know. If you guys have a suggestion, I would really like to see if there is a way of attracting students into, I think machine learning for one reason, it attracts students is that it's very easy to build things to get started off, right? I mean, you want to build a linear regression uh, model and do maybe, I don't know, spam identification. It's like few lines of code, like write three lines of code and you get a spam filter, which does something. And I think that is one reason that these courses become, other than the job prospect and everything else, even, even leaving that aside, but it gives you this instant gratification that, oh, you are doing something and you instant build something which works. Um, I think PL is a, is, is a subject which has a very, very, um, let me say, a very steep wall that you have to climb before you can really reap the, the, the fruits of the hard work, right? So like, you have to really understand a lot of theory before you can really build something which is useful. So if we can like, like have courses or ways of providing some sort of instant gratification saying that, oh, you learned this, can you build this and get it to work? I think that is one way to make these courses slightly more popular. Um, maybe I'm putting a sort of a, uh, I mean, an advertisement into what of one of the things that we have been doing recently. Um, but like this, this course on programming languages, it was not even a course on programming languages. It's a course on program analysis and verification and testing techniques. So this course is something we have been running for almost almost now twelve years, and I always had a lot of difficulty teaching this course because there is a breadth of topics. And again, the problem is that whenever you are, let's say I'm teaching symbolic execution, um, like it's very hard to really get them started on a symbolic execution. Actually. Like telling them to install CLI, which requires you to install LLVM first, and then install CLI on top of it, and then make it get the right versions in of LLVM and the right version of CLI to work together and get something going, it's hard. Like I, the like students spend almost a month just trying to install these tools. So, and forget when you are trying to do a lot of techniques, like I want to do symbolic execution, I want to do fuzzing, I want to teach, um, I don't know, like directive verification, I want to teach uh, abstract interpretation, maybe statistical bug localization techniques. So we have recently um, like uh, built a framework to teach these topics. And what we have done is that we have um, built it using, so there is this language called turtle, right? Which is used to teach um, programming to kids. So it's basically a small turtle, which, which you can use to draw on the screen. So you can write a program which draws a shape on the screen. And, uh, and then what we have done is that we have built a parser of that tool and uh, we, like, we have built small modules for that tool. So we have built, a, built in a small symbolic execution engine for that language in Python, a small abstract interpretation engine, a small directive verification, verification is still not in. Uh, we have done a statistical um, like test generator, 
uh, bug localizer engines. So these are small modules we have built on top of this language. And, uh, and the students have to fill in some part of the code to get the whole engine running. So this I found was at least we have been offering it this third offering of the course we are making. And this we found was something that was sort of able to attract more students and retain them in the course because it sort of gives them that instant gratification of like maybe a few lines of code and they can see a, a symbolic execution engine running. So I think PL is a very hard course in that manner to, uh, so this is something like, I mean, I'll be happy to give a talk on that also sometime if uh, we just presented in it in AC, uh, I just like last week. So it is something very recently recently done. Um, but, uh, but this is, I think they, I think we PL needs some of these topics, like some of these techniques of making to serve this instant gratification need that students today, I think students don't have the patience of like struggling through textbooks and understanding what is going on. They need some way of like instantly understanding, oh, well, I learned this and I can make this. Um, like, like I would really like more ideas if, I mean, if you have some suggestions on what else can be done with. PL topics because they, I think most of the time they seem very dry and very difficult to start up. Yeah, that, that's very thought provoking. Thank you. I, that's <laughs> something, that's something to think about. Yeah, all this time I thought like proving a theorem was gratification, but <laughs> I know. So, because you have done that hard work, right? Asim? So, I think after that you can feel that excitement. I totally understand what you mean. I was just... Uh, but yeah, but as a student, I mean, think about the student picking a ML course versus a PL course. Yeah, you yeah, no, know. Then it becomes a big <laughs> deal. Uh, any other question? We have five more minutes. Okay, if not, uh, well, then... actually, if we do have some time, I'm, I'm curious yeah. to know, like, uh, is um, is there a way in which we could, um, you know, take the course material that you have and uh, uh, play with it, and maybe, um, yeah, maintain it somewhere, uh, this kind of thing? Sure, sure, sure. So, um, yeah, Asim been, has been telling me this for some time. So, the the lectures are already available. Um, I have the whole uh, the whole code base, uh, the, including the assignment, the snippets, and everything. But they are slightly in a not in a great shape. So I'll need some time to clean it up and get it in a shape that I can I can share. But uh, what I'll do is I'll put it in a GitHub repository and I can share it. Is would that be a good thing? That sounds great. I mean, I, I, I'd be I mean I'd be happy to sort of you know if if it's if, to maybe I can. I'll write to you separately. I'd be happy to kind of work with you on making that. Uh, oh, wow. That would be today. amazing. Yeah, that would be that would be amazing. I can't ask for more. Yeah, uh, I, I have the whole thing, but it is really not neat right now. So I'll probably it will be great to yeah, like work with you on that. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it'd be awesome to have. I mean, if you have all this material prepared, like if it with you know if we if we can get it to a point where perhaps it's a it's a chapter in this online book and some, the, uh, with a playground where people can just try it. Maybe that's a way for. All the work that you put in, like for you know, uh, uh -huh. more people that, to benefit from it. Be, that would be a nice thing. So how how do we go about that? I mean, how um, what should be the right steps for that? Well, uh, I don't know. Maybe we can we can brainstorm a bit offline and and think about got what it, you know sure, how sure, sure. how to make that work. Sure, 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 sure. Because I already have the assignments and all these things are there, so. Uh, yeah, it's just a matter of like cleaning them up, but uh, but yeah, it's, it's all there, and we can probably create more if needed. So. Thank you. Yeah, I, I I'll reach out to you. Awesome, awesome. Thanks, thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks, thanks again, Sovaji. Uh, Really great, uh, great talk, and I think a lot of things to learn. Thank you. Thanks, Asim, for the invitation. It was it was great giving a talk here. It was really great. Okay, bye everyone. Bye, see you.